little bit more information following um, our webinar. Hello, I'm Deborah Anderson, Executive Director with the Oklahoma Partnership for School Readiness. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Building Equitable Futures for Oklahoma's Children and Early Childhood Research and Policy Series. We are excited to welcome over 200 participants to the conference today, including representatives from about 22 states and the UK. Um, 2020 has changed the way we learn, connect, and implement early childhood programs. Much has been said about the disruptions the pandemic created within our world. However, I'm pleased to announce a benefit that has resulted from this disruption as we formed a new partnership in Oklahoma that results in bringing you this lecture series. In the past, the Early Childhood Education Institute and the Oklahoma Partnership for School Readiness separately hosted conferences. OPSR's conference was focused on bringing in-state research to the field to connect research to policy with policy and practice. ECEI hosted a conference that focused on developing the capacity of early childhood leaders to improve service delivery. The pandemic created the impetus for our two organizations to join forces, expand our audience, and bring to you a series of topics critical to improving outcomes for young children and their families. Throughout our lecture series, we acknowledge the need to reduce bias and racism across our systems and strive to create a more equitable and just system for all children to achieve their full potential. A virtual platform provides us with the opportunity to invite participations from around the country and evidently around the world to join with minimal time and very few costs on their end. This platform also provides the opportunity to invite our country's top researchers to share their knowledge with a greater likelihood of being able to get on their schedules because they don't have to carve out two or three days for travel in order to attend in person in Oklahoma. While we miss in-person opportunities, the opportunity to widely share knowledge has truly been one of the unprecedented benefits of the pandemic. I have a few housekeeping details for today. Your microphones are muted and your cameras are disabled. This ensures that your experience is not disrupted during the conference. You may submit questions in the Q&A section. Um, those of you have probably uh, by now learned how to navigate Zoom, but if you look at the bottom of your Zoom, question, uh, Zoom screen, uh, the, the box that says Q&A is where you may submit your questions. The chat box is enabled. If you'd like to comment or share ideas, um, you may do so through the chat box. But please, I wanna remind you, only put your questions in the Q&A section so that we don't miss any of the questions um, that will be submitted today. These will be answered um, in various formats throughout the day. We will have a short break as we transition between our first two presentations. That will occur around 2.20. Um, our goal is to ensure that our speakers have adequate amount of time to both share their information and respond to your questions. So we're going to do our best um, to stay on, on our time frame at the same time, respecting their work and your questions. And now I'd like to get started by introducing Superintendent Joy Hoffmeister, who will provide our welcome. Superintendent Hoffmeister was originally elected to serve as State Superintendent of Public Instruction in 2014 and began her second term as Oklahoma State Superintendent in January 2019. Since taking office, the state has repealed ineffective state exams, released a more meaningful and user-friendly accountability system, and bolstered student safety. With an emphasis on collaboration, and a focus on ensuring Oklahoma's children have access to opportunities to achieve academic success, Hofmeister has strengthened academic standards and testing, revamped teacher evaluation, and brought statewide attention to the need for trauma-informed instructional practices that meet children where they are. I cannot express how um, valuable the partnership and relationship between our early childhood uh, network of partners and the State Department of Education have been. Um, Superintendent Hoffmeister is truly a champion for young children in her role as state superintendent. And at this time, I would like to introduce to you Superintendent Joy Hoffmeister. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Deborah. I, and I hope everyone can hear me okay. Let me know 
if, if there's any problems. Okay, yes, very absolutely. good. All right, well, the celebrated educator Maria Montessori called early childhood education the key to the betterment of society. And it's true, every problem we face as a society can be solved by education and high quality early education lays the groundwork for all future successes. It is the best investment we can make. I truly believe that. In Oklahoma, we know that high caliber pre-K allows our youngest learners to grow and gain positive educational experiences that help create pathways to better opportunities. While we recognize that a nurturing home is every child's first classroom, in a state with high poverty, access to early childhood education is crucial to shaping the future trajectory of all learners. And Oklahoma has consistently led the country in access to public uh, school pre-K, according to the National Institute of Early Education uh, Research at Rutgers University. Between uh, 2003 and 2010, Oklahoma ranked number one in voluntary access for our four-year-olds. Since 2011, Oklahoma remains in the top four, ranking number three in the most recent report. Oklahoma began its early childhood four-year-old program in 1980, and I know nobody on this call uh, or in this meeting uh, has any um, uh, lack of familiarity with um, truly the great uh, jewel that early childhood is for Oklahoma. Eight years after that start though, due to the success of the program, Oklahoma became the second state in the nation to provide free preschool for all four-year-olds. Today, 99% of Oklahoma school districts or public schools offer access to the program. And not only does Oklahoma serve a large number of students, but we consistently rank high for our high quality standards. Very few states are able to boast both high numbers and of, of participation and high quality instruction. Uh, we have done so by adopting academic standards for the first time, vertically aligned for pre-K all the way through 12th grade to ensure continuity and progressions of learning. Um, this work coincides with our eight-year strategic plan called Oklahoma Edge. Uh, one of our six goals within this plan is to align early childhood education to ensure that at least 75% of students are ready to read upon kindergarten entry. Now, um, Oklahoma has a long history of using cutting edge uh, research to inform state policies associated with preschool classrooms. And in 2001, researchers from Georgetown University began that long-term study tracking kids who were attending universal pre-K programs in Tulsa, documenting their academic success and progress over time. Uh, the study showed that middle school students, for those who may not be familiar with this, um, those middle school students who were in the pre-K years earlier, they had higher math test scores and were more likely to enroll in honors courses and were notice, noticeably less likely to have uh, been retained in um, previous grades. Moreover, we partnered with the Regional Education Laboratory Southwest, also known as REL Southwest, for three years. The partnership has allowed the State Department of Education to leverage the latest research-based practices for early childhood education within our uh, public schools. Uh, when the pandemic hit, we worked closely with our partners at REL Southwest to identify research-based practices to support pre-K educators and students with continued learning. And through this partnership, we've also been studying pre-K participation in Oklahoma, and we are conducting a study this coming spring to better understand instruction and assessments that are implemented in Oklahoma pre-K classrooms. The State Department of Education also participates in the Council of State Ch uh, School Chiefs High Quality Pre-K Meetings, which allows us access to better, or I'm, I'm sorry, to those best practices being researched and implemented in other states as well. And I'm proud to say that our emphasis on early childhood education is a true bright spot uh, in the nation, and we are so proud to showcase that uh, with our national uh, consortium. Uh, let me take a moment to acknowledge that 
these are challenging times for everyone and especially uh, those in education. The State Department of Ed remains committed to supporting students even as COVID cases continue to sharply rise across the state. Uh, we all know school is vital to our, our young lives of our preschoolers and, and those families. That's why we are focused on recapturing learning and hope to get our students back in the classrooms uh, while ensuring a safety and healthy re-entry um, for our students and staff and families. So during this time, we have worked to support our pre-K students with a variety of resources. Uh, when the pandemic first hit, we began offering weekly professional development to support pre-K teachers with distance learning. Uh, this summer, we published Return to Learn, launching instruction in pre-K and kindergarten to support our educators working through various delivery models. Uh, these documents uh, included instructional resources, social emotional supports, and family and community engagement strategies. Today's students are tomorrow's leaders. By investing in their future uh, early, we are paving the way for our, our child's uh, and our, our, um, all of those children in our classrooms success in school on uh, uh, a, a large scale. So today, uh, we, we're here to learn how research conducted in Oklahoma influenced pre-K policies in Oklahoma and across the country over the past 20 years. This is the first of a three-part series of research topics designed to reflect on how research has shaped Oklahoma's early childhood policy and practices, examine current research being conducted in our state, and how we can leverage knowledge that we gained to improve our early childhood programs and use research to inform decisions in the future. As a programming note, the lecture in January will explore how teacher, how teacher well-being impacts quality. While February's lecture will focus on equitable policies to improve the well-being of young children. Human services and early childhood initiatives, Secretary Justin Brown will kick off the January session and Dr. Uh, Tomas Diaz, I hope I've said that right, um, de, de La Rubia, and I am so sorry for butchering that, um, OU Vice President for Research and Partnership, he will or, um, open the uh, third session as well. So, oh, I hope I haven't um, um, uh, caused any offense with my um, failure uh, in pronunciation. Um, the speakers for today's lecture are Dr. Bill Gormley and Deborah Phillips of Georgetown University conducted early research on Oklahoma's volunteer, voluntary four-year-old program um, as well. There, and it's good, good to, I, I'm gonna give a shout out to uh, Dr. Gormley. I haven't seen you since probably 2015 um, or maybe 2016. Their work, though, has shaped our nation's priorities on the importance of early learning prior to kindergarten entry. And Drs. Anna Johnson of Georgetown University and Sherry Castle of OU Tulsa will share current research that follows a cohort of children who participated in early learning programs and those who did not. They will discuss how this research highlights later academic outcomes for both groups. And our very own Tiffany Neal, Deputy Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction for the State Department of Education, will talk about the future of pre-K in Oklahoma. She will share uh, the current initiatives and plans that we have for quality improvements. And finally, Dr. Diane Horm, uh, George Kaiser Family Foundation Endowed Chair in Early Childhood Education and Director of the Early Childhood Education Institute will provide closing remarks. So on that note, I'd like to welcome you to this lecture series and thank you for your dedication to our youngest learners. Through partnerships and dynamic research, we are building Oklahoma's future one child at a time. Have a great conference. Thank you so much, Superintendent Hoffmeister, for those um, invigorating remarks to get us started on this lecture series. And at this time, we are prepared to move into our first session. 
Um, and so we would, um, I'm not going to waste um, you, our, their precious time and your time uh, providing introductions. We do have bios available on our website, but it is with great pleasure that I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Deborah Phillips, Dr. Bill Gormley, and Dr. Sarah Anderson to uh, give us a little bit of some historical perspective on the impact that Oklahoma has been able to make across the country. So thank you so much. Welcome for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, Joy, thank you so much for that splendid introduction that really laid the groundwork for what we're going to do today. And we promise to, to see you in Oklahoma City sometime soon, once the pandemic lifts. Uh, it is very convenient uh, to meet with you all here today, wherever here actually is, but we would actually prefer the inconvenience of having to travel to, to Tulsa and Oklahoma City. Uh, we've always enjoyed visiting with you folks in Tulsa, visiting uh, your schools and seeing the excitement that's generated by your teachers, seeing the, the learning that's taking place with your students, and then hopefully visiting Bodine Seafood in the evening. And we've also visited uh, in Oklahoma City with Joy and uh, with members of her staff an opportunity to share our findings, and hopefully later an opportunity to hear some good fiddle playing by Kyle Dillingham, if we're lucky. So we don't mind the inconvenience, and we look forward to the inconvenience in the future. We're going to present today, and when I say we, I mean um, my friend and longtime colleague, Deborah Phillips, uh, from the psychology department at Georgetown, who's uh, been working with me on this project roughly for the past 20 years. Hard to believe, Deborah, but it's, <laughs> it's been almost 20 years. And uh, Sarah Anderson, who was with us uh, at Georgetown for a couple years as a postdoctoral fellow, and who now thankfully is, is very much still involved in the project uh, while she is currently at uh, Child Trends as a senior research analyst there. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Yes, Bodine's is the best. Thank you for that uh, confirmation. <laughs> uh, we've had many uh, colleagues, faculty members, and students uh, work on this project over the past 20 years. And I mentioned some of them here. I should say that we probably had close to 100 uh, graduate students, including master's students, PhD students in different departments and a bunch of undergraduates uh, who uh, worked intimately with us on this project. Next slide. Um, we've benefited enormously from partnerships, first with Tulsa Public Schools, that was the cornerstone uh, that uh, all this began with. But as the project has moved forward in lots of exciting, but sometimes unexpected new directions, we have benefited from close relations with a variety of other partners whom we've listed here. And I just wanna say as sincerely as I can that we are eternally grateful to you because we know that it's not always easy to uh, supply uh, data to pesky academic researchers. Uh, next slide. Let me also thank our uh, foundations who have generously supported this work over the past uh, 20 years, including especially the Heising Simons Foundation, which uh, continues to support us today. With that as a prelude, I'm gonna turn the mic, if there is a mic, over to my colleague, Deborah Phillips, who's going to uh, talk about the effects of Tulsa's early childhood education programs on school readiness. Deborah. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Um, I am just delighted to be here. As Bill was expressing, um, we both have very fond feelings about Tulsa and are just eternally indebted to the leadership of the Oklahoma schools um, and the Tulsa schools. And it's been, it's a relationship that is now 20 years old and um, we look forward, forward to yet more years of collaboration. So thanks to everybody and it's thanks to everyone for joining us today. It's wonderful to see such a large group. So I'm gonna be sharing with you, you can go to the next, next slide, please. The results, um, well, this is 
this is why we all do what we do, right? <laughs> Darling children. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be presenting results from our 2005 cohort of pre-K students. Um, our early work, Bill, Bill's and my early work in Tulsa, which did start in 2001, actually, um, uh, really uh, was among the earliest research programs looking at the effects of pre-K education in terms of its role in preparing young children for formal schooling. Um, really among one of the first research programs to ask this kind of blunt question of does it work? And as such, it was really um, a high wire act. Um, it was a very high stakes question. Um, and because we were among the first out of the gate, the nation's eyes really were on Tulsa to see what we would learn as a proof of concept for everyone's hopes for pre-K education. Um, I do want to, in that context, acknowledge the then superintendent of the Tulsa schools, David Sawyer, who I still to this day view very much as a courageous hero who was willing to let um, these two unknown researchers from Georgetown University of all places to kind of waltz in and, and take a look at whether it was working. Um, next slide, please. Fortunately, we delivered very good news, um, and we found that the children who had experienced a year of pre-K in Tulsa as compared to their counterparts who had actually not yet <laughs> experienced pre-K um, were uh, many months ahead of their, these comparison children in their school readiness measured as their cognitive skills. So. Uh, the first two bars <laughs> um, show you that they were, you know, nine and seven months ahead of children who had not experienced pre-K in their literacy skills and five months ahead in their math skills. The applied problems test is a math test. Next slide, please. We also found that the children who benefited the most were low income children. Um, the blue bars are um, children who receive free lunches. Um, but it's also important to recognize that all children at all income levels did show appreciable uh, progress in their school readiness um, uh, across these different assessments. Next slide, please. Then as now, pre-K in Tulsa relied on a mixed delivery system including reliance on a CAP Head Start programs. A very successful partnership and, and, and also one of the additional ways in which Tulsa provided a model for the nation. Next slide, please. Again, we found uh, very significant and meaningful impacts on school readiness on both literacy and math assessments. These children were multi multiple months ahead of children who had not experienced CAP Head Start Pre-K. Next slide, please. We also saw impacts on important dimensions of social development. So if you just direct your attention to the far right side of this graph under the word timid, um, you'll see that children attending both uh, the school-based pre-K classrooms and the Head Start classrooms um, showed significant reductions in teacher ratings of timidity. Think of this as a child who's pretty withdrawn and very hesitant to participate in group lessons, for example. So we got children to be just sort of more actively engaged. We did, you did. <laughs> um, next slide, please. And we also saw impacts on attentiveness. Um, think of a child who is very eager to learn, who's a good listener and is able to avoid um, all the temptations and distractions that can divert their attention away from learning. Um, next slide, please. So why did we see such whopping impacts <laughs> in Tulsa, such exciting news? Um, so we didn't begin to look comprehensively at that question back then, but we did look at the quality of the education that children were receiving in Tulsa's pre-K pre classrooms at the time. We actually went into um, every single 
uh, TPS and Head Start classroom and watch to see what it is that teachers were doing that might explain um, this strong boost in children's school readiness. Um, and what we found is that compared to a national sample of then pre-K classrooms, um, the classrooms in Tulsa offered children higher quality instruction across a range of dimensions that we looked at um, uh, uh, than did the typical t uh, t uh, pre-K program across the country. So those stars there that you see indicate that there was a meaningful significant difference in the quality of instruction. We captured a range of elements like rich language exchanges, conversations that extended learning, open-ended questions, back and forth questions with children, use of feedback that really expands their understanding of what they're learning. Uh, next slide, please. We also found that the teachers in the Tulsa classrooms also spent more time on academics than did teachers in your typical pre-K classroom across the country. So again, you see all those little stars each of those is a meaningful difference. So more time reading to the children, more time practicing letters and sounds, more time engaged in math and science. So those are significant differences. Next slide, please. Um, notably, um, we did find that there were differences across the school-based classrooms and the CAP Head Start classrooms in terms of time on literacy and math and fantasy play. And you can see that the blue bars represent the uh, school-based classrooms. The yellow bars represent the Head Start classrooms. So they're still spending a good chunk of time. Everybody is, but we did see some of those um, differences. Um, in the intervening years, we know that CAP Head Start has focused very hard on ramping up their instructional time. So final slide, please. In sum, just to review quickly, um, we found that both the school-based TPS pre-K classrooms and the CAP Head Start pre-K classrooms improved children's school readiness substantially. It did work, <laughs> to go back to that very blunt question. We did find that stu disadvantaged students received the biggest boost of all, but everybody benefited. Um, and we will say a little bit in a moment about um, the fact that your program is universal, which we think is extremely important. <laughs> um, so why do we see this? Well, both programs are high quality programs. It is also significant, we believe, that early education teachers in Oklahoma must have a BA degree, they are early childhood certified, and they are paid a regular public school wage and an equitable wage across these two settings, um, both of which are, needless to say, extremely important. Um, early care and education teachers in Tulsa are very good at providing instructional support compared to other states, and they do devote um, considerable time and more time to core academic subjects than in other states. And now we're talking 2005, remember? Um, and so, you know, the next question really is, with all this promising early evidence, did these programs set children along more promising academic pathways? So I'll turn the microphone, such as it is, back to Bill to talk to you about what did we learn next? Thank you, Deborah. Uh, well, having established that Tulsa's early childhood education programs have strong positive effects on school readiness, we had two choices. Uh, we could turn to something else, uh, which would have meant less uh, seafood at Bodine's for sure. Uh, or we could investigate an even trickier question. Uh, do differences between pre-K participants and non-participants persist over time? This would require for us a different methodology and it would also require us to look beyond Tulsa Public Schools because many of the students from our original cohort of 4,000 students would move over time from TPS to another local school district, to another non-local school district, or out of state. 
If they moved out of state, we would regrettably have to ignore them for a while, at least until college. If they moved within the state to another public school, we would in principle be able to keep track of them and include them in our analysis. So in simple terms, the question we've been asking for the past 10 years or so is this, do differences between Tulsa's pre-K alumni and non-alumni persist over time or do they fade away or even in the worst case scenario, disappear? Our assumption is that the answer to that question depends in part on the original scaffolding provided to the kids at age four. Uh, is it fragile? Next slide. As in the case of a famous straw house. Or is it durable? Next slide. As in the case of an equally famous brick house. Uh, but there's another question that we don't have a convenient image for, and that is, are there sustaining environments, especially in the K through 12 school system, after students complete their pre-K year? If there are, we posit, then persistent differences or advantages in favor of pre-K alumni are likely to persist or endure though they may manifest themselves in different ways, largely because older students are free to make more choices than younger students. Next slide. So let's see what we found in third grade. You can go to the next slide here. Um, in third grade, we decided to zero in on standardized test scores, which were available to us from the State Department of Education. And what this slide essentially shows using the same metric at kindergarten and in third grade is some effects of pre-K participation on verbal skills, which are in blue, and on math skills, which are in orange. At least I think that's orange. So to the left, you see the initial effects as measured by effect sizes using something called propensity score matching. And on the right, you see some third grade results for reading and math as measured by the state standardized test scores. If you compare the blue histogram on the left to the blue on the right, what you could see is that the verbal impacts are actually diminishing quite a bit over time. So there is fade out. It's not totally disappeared, but once you get to third grade, there's no longer a statistically significant difference between the kids who are in the TPS pre-K program and the kids who are not. But look at math. Math is interesting because um, even though the initial impact on math test scores as of kindergarten entry was smaller in magnitude than the initial impact on uh, reading and spelling skills, the uh, fade out is less for math. In fact, there's not much fade out at all from kindergarten to third grade as measured by this particular comparison. So what we concluded uh, from that uh, based on our third grade analysis is that students' mathematical boost that they get from participation in the TPS pre-K program did in fact persist over time as late as third grade. I should say that we were not able to look at uh, the Head Start program at this stage of our analysis. Although as you'll see in what's coming next, uh, we did actually include Head Start for uh, grade seven. So next slide. The next step in our research journey was to look at middle school children. And here I should say that uh, our strategy uh, was to um, 
our strategy for middle school was to look at a wider range of outcomes, uh, which is possible because uh, you have more uh, outcomes from school administrative data to work with. Students are making more choices. They're uh, more intentional. They're beginning to take charge of their own educational destiny and their own educational journey. And therefore, with that in mind, we looked at a much wider array of outcomes than we did in our previous analysis at third grade. This analysis was also better because we were able to forge additional partnerships with some uh, local uh, school districts other than just uh, TPS, and that includes Union, Broken Arrow, and Jenks. And the state of Oklahoma was very generous in supplying data from the State Department of Education as well. So at this point, uh, we were not able to track all of our 4,000 students, but we were able to track uh, about uh, 3,000 or so of them uh, at the state level. Next slide. We found in our middle school analysis that yet again, there are uh, statistically significant differences between the students who are in the Tulsa Public Schools pre-K program and comparable students who were not as late as the end of seventh grade. The effects were relatively modest uh, as reflected in an effect size of 0.10, but they were unquestionably statistically significant. Uh, next slide. We also found that uh, as of middle school, students who were in the TPS pre-K program were more likely to enroll in an honors course. This finding was also statistically significant and encouraging. Next slide. Uh, as uh, Joy Hoffmeister mentioned in her introductory re remarks, one of our most important findings has been that uh, participation in the TPS pre-K program is associated with a significant reduction in grade retention. Uh, that's a big deal for two reasons. First, because grade retention is costly to school systems in the short run. And secondly, because many national studies show that grade retention is associated with negative outcomes for children, not only in their educational achievement, but also in their ultimate uh, uh, employment and other life experiences. Next slide. Uh, so this is a summary of what we found in our middle school analysis. Next slide. I should say that there were some null effects. There were some outcomes that we looked at where we did not see any statistically significant differences between the students who were in TPS pre-K and a comparable set of students. We didn't see statistically significant differences for standardized reading test scores or grade point average or special education placement or absenteeism or school suspensions or for the most part, uh, student attitudes, although we did actually see some positive consequences for what is sometimes called grit or uh, a student's ability to uh, get uh, through difficult situations with a certain amount of determination. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we were able to look at Head Start and specifically CAP Head Start and its outcomes at middle school. And here also we found some positive effects. We found that uh, CAP Head Start alums are less likely to be chronically absent. We found that CAP Head Start alums score higher on standardized math tests. And we find that CAP Head Start alums are less likely to have been retained in grade than a comparison group. Next slide. Uh, so with this behind us, we began asking some even more interesting questions, at least for us, they're interesting questions, and that is, how are we to explain the fact uh, that these effects are persisting over time? That there are still as late as middle school, uh, some uh, 
statistically significant differences that uh, indicate that even that late in the game, students who are in the TPS pre-K program and the CAP Head Start program are ahead of their peers academically. How might we explain this? Well, we don't have uh, a full set of explanations, but we have at least one partial explanation and it has to do with this sustainability uh, argument or the sustainable environment hypothesis as it's sometimes called that I mentioned earlier. The proposition here is that if there are some school experiences or opportunities available to kids who benefited initially from a strong high quality early childhood education program, then that may enable them to continue to progress so that they are still noticeably better off academically than students who did not have the benefit of that outstanding early childhood education program some years ago. And in this article, which is up on our website for CROCUS, that's the Center for Research on Children in the United States at Georgetown University, we began to look at one of those possible intervening variables, which is magnet schools. Next slide. Uh, what this uh, table shows you is, I think, very interesting. Uh, it shows you for different types of magnets in middle school that students who were in one of your early childhood education programs, either TPS Pre-K or CAP Head Start, are more likely to enroll in one of your magnet middle schools, whether they're lottery schools or so-called admission schools. And furthermore, keep this in mind for future reference, uh, students who are in one of your early childhood education programs are also more likely uh, to enroll in one of your magnet high schools. Why is this important? It's important because as we showed in the article that I just uh, highlighted earlier, we've demonstrated that students who enroll in one of your magnet high schools in, uh, I'm sorry, students who enroll in one of your magnet middle schools in Tulsa uh, are more likely to do better academically uh, in terms of both reading test scores and math test scores than a comparable set of other students, even after controlling for their baseline cognitive skills in kindergarten and for their third grade reading and math scores. So what that suggests is that the magnet schools in Tulsa are providing a considerable degree of value added that enables students who are in one of the early childhood education programs to con continue to excel, to continue to thrive, to continue to flourish. This is one element of a sustaining environment. Next slide. So, why do Tulsa's early childhood education programs produce lasting positive effects? I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, discuss this in, in any detail. Let's turn to the next slide. Uh, why are middle school effects not broader or deeper? I think that's a perfectly legitimate question. Uh, it makes sense to celebrate the positive effects that we've highlighted here, but I'm sure that uh, uh, those of you who are school administrators would want us to ask uh, this question too. Are there ways in which we could broaden or deepen some of the positive impacts? What are the factors that make that challenging and difficult? Certainly one of those factors in Oklahoma, uh, sad to say, has been a, a series of uh, school funding cuts. Uh, dating back to about a decade ago that have made it very different for school districts throughout the, uh, the state of Oklahoma, including Tulsa's, uh, to thrive and to flourish and uh, to provide uh, excellent education in all of their classrooms. Related to that is uh, the attendant difficulties associated with uh, school funding cuts that make it increasingly difficult uh, to recruit and to retain uh, teachers generally, 
uh, but also especially uh, teachers in, let's say, STEM subjects in particular. Next slide. So at this point, I'm going to turn the baton over to Sarah Anderson from Child Trends, who's uh, an esteemed member of our team and who's going to uh, talk with you a little bit about the bottom line and also we'll talk with you about our future research. Sarah. Hi, thank you, Bill. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, so I'm going to pick up where Bill left off and talk a little bit about some of the cost benefit analyses we did. Um, uh, both of the, there's a couple different cost benefit analyses we did. The first one was really focused on looking at the initial kindergarten impacts from some of the work that Deborah discussed. And these are the results of those analyses that Bill worked on with um, Tim Bartik and um, Shirley Adelstein. And what they found based on using some of Chetty's work predicting um, the effects of this um, the increase in achievement on later earnings is that there was about a three or four to one cost benefit for the full and the half day pre-K programs. Um, you can see here that's also broken down by free lunch status with free reduced or full price lunch here. Um, so that was from the in initial kindergarten analyses. Um, next slide, please. These next set of analyses then use the results of the um, third grade paper that Bill was describing to look at both the effects through. So here we, we focus really on the, um, the grade retention effects. And so um, what we see here is that, or rather from the middle school work, from based on those analyses, um, there, it's projected from pre-K to grade retention, grade retention to an earnings benefit and a crime benefit. And we used here the NLSY um, to use generate those projections. Um, and what we found here is that we still see in the last column there, the a, a favorable benefit cost ratio of almost two to one um, through grade retention and the effects on earnings and crime. We also see it's broken down here by different subgroups um, you know, when we're looking at things, especially like crime, we often see differential cost benefit for um, male students, for example. But in generally, in general, across um, subgroups, we do see those general, those favorable benefit to cost ratios. Um, we haven't extended that into work on high school yet, um, but those are some of the initial cost benefit results. Next slide. So what we're gonna do here is pivot and start to talk about the Tulsa pre-K study um, and looking at high school outcomes. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is really just a bit of a teaser. Um, we've done some of the analyses, but we are uh, we tend to some, uh, wait till our work gets through peer review to share all of the work. Um, but we wanna tell you what we are currently looking at and some of the initial um, the initial results showing us that, that our analytic plan is really going to keep working and pan out. So next slide, please. So our questions here then are, do the initial positive effects of preschool fade out over time, specifically looking at high school? Do some positive effects persist despite the passage of time? And do new effects emerge in high school that could not be detected earlier? So for example, do we see any associations with pre-K or Head Start in high school that we didn't observe in our middle school results? Um, next slide. So what this slide shows us, oh, maybe click. No, I think this is good, this is good. Um, so what this slide, no, sorry, back, thank you. So what this slide shows us is our analytic sample that we're using to look at our high school study. So um, as so what we have here is our TPS pre-K alum and our CAP Head Start alum um, and the number of students we've been able to follow into high school. I'll, on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about our outcomes. But what we do see is that we've been able to track um, a large number of our students from our original uh, kindergarten study through high school, um, both in the pre-K group and the CAP Head Start group, and then in our comparison group. Next slide. We've been able to do this, again, referencing to Bill's prior comment, 
thanks to some great ongoing and new partnerships with Tulsa Public Schools, Union Public Schools, Jenks, Broken Arrow, and also um, we have uh, started working with Epic, the one of the online charter schools, to um, to obtain their data as well. And so, from the school district data, what we what we are going to look at are things like course taking, um, their grades, uh, their GPA, things like suspensions, and then also working with the Oklahoma Department of Education, we're fortunate to be able to track more students through that database because, of course, we know that. Families are mobile, and so we've seen a number of students move throughout the state of Oklahoma. With those data, we're able to look at things like uh, attendance and chronic absenteeism, SAT scores or ACT scores, and then also importantly, grade retention. I'll also mention that we are going to look at high school graduation and an on-time graduation to understand if pre-K affects then uh, persist to things like graduation. Next slide, please. And so this then breaks down our sample size in those two categories. We have our Tulsa Metro school districts and then our state data. And so what we see is that through high school, when I say high school, we right now are focusing on 11th grade. We see almost 50% of our sample from kindergarten that we are able to trace in our Tulsa Metro sample. And then we have just over 70% of our original sample that we're able to trace throughout the state of Oklahoma. So the attrition are going to be things like students going to private school, homeschooling, going to other states, things like that. Next slide, please. So this just shows how we are planning the, the specific dependent variables that we're going to be looking at in these analyses. So as I mentioned, things like absenteeism, SAT and ACT scores, we are looking at enrollment in advanced placement and interna um, IB, international baccalaureate courses in our middle school work as Bill uh, mentioned, we were able to find some indication that our pre-K students were more likely to enroll in honors courses. And so we are still interested in that kind of, are these some of our students uh, still more likely to seek out some of those courses? We um, also are looking at grade retention, which has been um, really kind of one of our most stunning results we also are going to examine advanced math taking. So our students uh, kind of taking math courses that are more advanced than, are, than they tend to, uh, then kind of is expected based on state um, standards. So things like statistics or pre-calculus or calculus. We're also looking at course failures. Are students less likely to fail a course? Um, again, which should help them progress through high school in a timely fashion. And then lastly, we have a grade point average, um, which is, again, is indexed through, um, through 11th grade. We're looking at weighted and unweighted um, GPA. And I'll mention briefly in terms of our analyses in, in our middle school paper, we did, multi uh, we did uh, multiple regression using a propensity score weight, which is really kind of just a fancy way of making sure that our um, groups of interest, the pre-K and the Head Start groups are closely matched and comparable to our comparison group students. And so if we go to the next slide, what we see here, and I won't get into too many of the details of this rather technical slide, but if you look at the, the, weighted, um, the weighted dots kind of there on the right-hand side of those two panels, basically that is showing us that when we use this analytic technique with our high school data, we are able to get groups of students, the, the pre-K, and the comparison group students or the Head Start and the comparison group students that really are quite similar on background characteristics. When we use this, this analytic technique, these students really um, do uh, look quite similar on, again, these observable characteristics. Next slide, please. So I'm going to turn it over to Deborah here, but I will just say that um, we are very excited to be doing these um, high school analyses and high school graduation and hope to be pivoting to post-secondary as well. We have some um, exciting results that we will be very eager to share, but for now, um, we do think that these analyses are on a really firm foundation. So Deborah. 
Thank you, Sarah. Um, so um, I really probably should have put that slide back up with the two adorable children that were at the very beginning of the, of the session. Um, it's just to say that this is really why the three of us do what we do. This is very arduous work <laughs> um, and we really want it to make a difference in the lives of young children. So we, we were really delighted when President Obama mentioned Tulsa Pre-K in the 2013 State of the Union address. Um, we feel like this work has really put Tulsa Public Schools pre-K on the map. And to this day, I can assure you that it is considered one of the crown jewels among our nation's pre-K programs. To this day, people look to Tulsa um, for, um, no, I need you to go back a slide, please. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, uh, at, you know, for inspiration about what truly is possible uh, with an investment in pre-K education. Um, we really provided some of the earliest and soundest uh, bodies of evidence um, for enduring impacts despite some fade out, you know, truly showing that pre-K is not only good early education policy, but also good economic policy for the country. As Superintendent Hoffmeister said at the beginning, there is really no better investment um, for the future than early education. Um, we also uh, demonstrated that um, these goals can be met, but they were met in the context of Tulsa, which did provide higher quality pre-K education than many other states at the time. Um, it did employ um, highly educated and trained and experienced teachers. It paid them adequate wages <clears throat> and it was a universal program. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There's a lot of active debate today about universal pre-K education. Um, we do know that in the context of Tulsa's universal program, we found these um, strong, immediate, and enduring impacts. We don't know if that would have been the case with a more targeted program. Um, so we've all become uh, strong believers in, in universal pre-K. Even though the lower income children have shown stronger impacts, perhaps that is because we had, you had mixed classrooms of children. We do know that the peer learning environment matters a great deal for young children. Um, and then finally, we took the lead in working with a group of colleagues across different disciplines across the country in developing a consensus statement about pre-K education. Um, that really did talk about the fact that we don't need to keep asking whether it works, that there are more um, meaningful and complicated questions to ask going forward. I'd be happy to give you a link to that document um, if you would like it. Um, so that takes us to the next generation study that you'll be hearing about after the break. And I just want to set it up with a few words. So. Now, now we can go to the next slide deck, please. Terrific. Do you want to do that now or after the Q and A? Um, I think I better just do it now. Um, I'll be very quick. Um, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so what you're going to hear about in the next panel is a study that really looked at what do we now need to learn about pre-K education. It is um, many years after 2005. Um, and, and now we know that we can produce strong impacts and enduring impacts. So what is this next generation question? There really are two questions. The first is how can we give preschoolers the strongest possible boost into elementary education? What are the active ingredients? Somebody has already asked a question about, was it about class size? What was it that really gave these kids such a strong boost into kindergarten uh, back in 2000, back in the early 2000s. So what are those active ingredients? Um, we know, we all know that the heart and soul of those active ingredients are the teachers. So it's critical to look at how can we best support and retain top teachers? How can we ensure 
that teachers are supported. Um, it's a stressful job, especially now. How can we make sure in that context that we are um, respecting, compensating, providing our teachers with the, it, the critical sources of support that they need? Um, and of course, um, in pre-K classrooms across the country, we are seeing a much more diverse student body. And um, I don't think um, we'll have time to talk about it this afternoon, but I do want to assure you that we are looking specifically at the experiences of the dual language learners in your programs and of the children with special needs. The next big question is what happens after they leave pre-K? Um, what is it about the experience? Um, Bill and Sarah talked a little bit about the role of magnet schools, but what uh, we're hopefully setting children on a pathway of continuous learning. So what is it that happens in K classrooms and first grade classrooms and so on? Next slide, please. Um, so we really are also in the context of this new study trying to kind of change the frameworks that people are using. So instead of asking, are the impacts of pre-K sustained? We think it's really important to be asking, do we have an effective pre-K to third grade system and beyond for that matter? Um, rather than just focusing or focusing primarily on achievement outcomes, which you have seen in the middle school and high school work that Bill and Sarah are doing, that we also feel it's critical to look at supports for achievement like attendance, like students' feelings of connection to their teachers. Um, and we're focusing very much on self-regulation as a critical underlying skill. And you'll hear about that uh, momentarily. Um, and finally, we are moving from these kind of global assessments of classroom climate or quality to observations that are much more specifically tied to our central outcomes. So continuing to look at math and literacy instruction, but also looking at supports for self-regulation in the classroom and looking at teacher-child relationships. So last slide. Um, so my final words, our final words really are words of thanks um, to Superintendent Deborah Gist and Deputy Superintendent Paula Shannon and all of their predecessors who have just been remarkably supportive of our work. And it is asking a lot of a school system to allow researchers like us to come in, walk into classrooms, test the kids, take up teacher time. Um, so we are just uh, forever indebted to all of you for um, allowing us to continue with this work. Um, all of the Head Start Educare and TPS teachers and principals and directors and staff for their incredible generosity towards us and for letting us give them voice, which is also a lot of how we think about our work. Um, all of the participating families, of course, for trusting us with their children and to the children for giving us their insights into how best to support their early learning through their answers to our questions and our tests. Um, and finally, to our funders, Bill has identified the funders of the sort of Gen 1 and follow-up work and Sherry and Anna will share with us um, the funders of our subsequent work. So thank you so much for this opportunity. We do have time for a few questions and I know we've been answering those that have been submitted online. Yeah, I've identified a few. Thank you, Deborah, and thank mm -hmm. you, You're Sarah. Welcome. Sarah, do you want to join us uh, visually, or are there crazy things going on in your household at the moment? <laughs> Not at the moment. I can't believe that our dog, Augie, has been silent through all of this. I assume that can mean only one thing, which is that he's sleeping. So um, I think we might have time to focus on uh, perhaps three questions that I've red flagged. So let me begin with one of them. Do we do we look at demographics other than income? And the answer to that question is most assuredly yes. We have some wonderful data that go back all the way to uh, kindergarten where we conducted a parent survey. And that parent survey indicated to us such things as the mother's highest level of education uh, whether or not the biological father was present at home, uh, the childcare experiences of that student uh, before enrolling in pre-K or Head Start, uh, internet access, uh, the primary language spoken at home, uh, 
the number of books in the house, a rough estimate. So we've taken advantage of that information and other contextual information to try to look at a variety of uh, subgroups, uh, focusing especially on race and ethnicity, focusing on school lunch eligibility, but also using that rich information to inform our analysis. Um, another question was asked, and, and Deborah, I think maybe you're a good person to address this one. Um, were we able to examine the effects of variations in class size on the performance of our students? Right. So um, <laughs> one of the wonderful things about Tulsa Pre-K is that you have uh, guidelines for class size. Most of your teachers have BA degrees, as we've mentioned. So the downside of that for us as researchers is we weren't able to look at variation in those variables, teacher training, teacher education, class size, class ratios, and so on, as they affected um, both the quality of education that was delivered and any impacts on the children. So good news, bad news. <laughs> um, other um, places that have, other investigators that have looked at those variables don't find a lot going on for class size. But again, class size doesn't vary much in pre-K programs across the country, actually. You know, 20 kids per classroom like you have um, is, is quite typical, actually. Um, in terms of teacher education, in all honesty, the evidence on the role of teacher education is mixed, and we could have a very long conversation um, about that. Why is that? What is it that teacher education is a proxy for, and what is it not a proxy for? That's exactly why we, rather than just relying on that as a predictor of quality, we do go inside the classroom door and look at what teachers are actually doing to get a much more nuanced look at what is it, what are those active ingredients, what really does make a difference for children's early learning? Thank you, Deborah. Uh, one other question was asked uh, by someone who pointed out that Oklahoma has one of the highest teenage pregnancy rates in the United States. And uh, she or he wanted to know uh, whether we have looked at all at the possibility that early childhood education might reduce teen pregnancy rates. Uh, to start the ball rolling, I would say no. Uh, <laughs> but I would add that we did look at, uh, at uh, teenage students' attitudes as part of our middle school work. And one of the, we, some of the questions that we asked uh, focused on student attitudes towards risky behaviors, uh, which included uh, alcohol consumption, drug use, uh, and uh, injudicious sexual activity. Uh, we did not see any evidence uh, of an early childhood education impact on those particular attitudinal measures, but that's not to say that that's definitive. What I would like to say is that uh, in the work going forward, uh, Sarah and I and our co-investigators are trying to take a closer look at teenagers generally and specifically uh, juvenile justice. So Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about what that work might look like? Sure, real briefly, we are, you know, we know from a lot of other studies look at, of the longitudinal effects of early childhood education programs. Um, like Obsidarian or, or Perry that they did look at and others look at um, criminal justice involvement. And so one thing that we have been exploring is in partnering with the um, Office of Juvenile Affairs um, in getting uh, juvenile justice involvement data. And we, we have not obtained the, the full funding or data for that yet, but when we initially kind of did a proof of concept, unfortunately it does look like um, a fair uh, number of, of participants from our sample can be identified in these data. And so this is something that we very well may pursue and kind of the anticipation might be that it would lead to lower, lower levels um, of, of juvenile justice, justice involvement. We know that there are a lot of other ins and outs and compl complications with, with these data, um, but it's certainly something that we are hoping to, to also pursue. 
Thank you, Sarah. Do we have any other questions? We've tried to either respond via a text message or to respond live to the questions that were asked. Uh, I think we have a couple more minutes uh, if you have additional questions. Would any of my colleagues like to add something? Well, uh, not hearing any uh, clamor for additional questions and answers, I'd just like to say that we're delighted to have participated in this virtual encounter and uh, kudos to those of you who organized it uh, for uh, arranging it uh, to, uh, to proceed without a hitch, at least I think so. For all I know, it's possible that 100 people were not able to participate <laughs> who wanted to, but I suspect that's not true. Uh, we have tangible evidence of human activity out there. So we think that this worked splendidly and we want to again, uh, thank our many partners uh, who have made our research possible over the, over the years and who continue to make it possible going into the future. Uh, we greatly appreciate uh, your cooperation. And I'd also like to close by saying that we, we hope that you all uh, are able to get through uh, the next several months uh, safely and in good health. Uh, our hearts go out to you. I know it's very, very challenging to make uh, all the difficult decisions that go into deciding exactly whether to open up your classrooms, and if so, under what circumstances, and if so, uh, for what students. We know that those are heartrending and extremely difficult decisions, and uh, we wish you uh, all the best as you cope with, with those uh, excruciating challenges. And we look forward to seeing many of you in person one of these days. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah, Bill, and Sarah, for such an amazing uh, presentation. Since I've got a couple minutes, I'm going to say this session really wrapped up a lot of years of research and put everything into one package. And I know, like many of you, I have read uh, the, the separate uh, research papers that have been um, published over the years. This was just such a great summary and a, a great tying together of everything. So thank you so much. We appreciate your time, your preparation, uh, your, your great um, knowledge that you imparted. And I think also as, as we think about looking toward the future, I'll make my plug that we are really trying to support a better system to integrate um, information across agencies. So hopefully if Oklahoma can accomplish those steps, it can accelerate some of your research um, in order to be able to connect the dots as kids um, become older and experience different outcomes. So we look forward in continuing to work with you to, to monitor um, how we're doing. So with that, um, uh, we are going to give everybody uh, maybe a tad more than about a five minute break um, to let you uh, catch up on emails or get another uh, cup of coffee or a bottle of water. So we will see you back at um, central time about 225. So see you in just a few minutes. Thank you all. Bye.
Welcome back. Hope everybody um, is ready to move on to our next session. Um, we had such a great uh, discussion earlier. Before we get started, I did want to mention that there um, is an opportunity. You will be able to get a recording, uh, be able to get a link to the recording of these sessions. Um, and Diane will give you more information about that um, at the end of the session. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to our next presenters who are going to talk about our Tulsa um, Pre-K Research Point 2.0, kind of the next generation of research in our state. And they're going to discuss some ongoing um, and new information that's recently been released on the Tulsa Seed Study. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Anna Johnson, Dr. Sherry Castle, and Dr. Deborah Phillips. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am Anna Johnson from Georgetown University, and I'm thrilled to be here um, with all of my colleagues, uh, some of whom I know very well, um, Sarah, Bill, Deborah Phillips, Diane, of course, Sherry, with whom I will share the stage, um, as well as new folks that I don't know as well um, at the state office um, and throughout Oklahoma, and of course, all of the attendees who are joining us. So. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm honored to be among all of you. Um, and I'm looking forward to sharing some of our emerging results from uh, Pre-K 2.0. So I will go ahead and share my screen um, and you'll let me know if you can see that. Are we good? Yes. yes. Thank you. Great. Um, so this is Tulsa Pre-K Research 2.0, standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, Deborah Phillips, Bill Gormley, and Sarah Anderson's kind of first generation 1.0 Tulsa Pre-K study. Um, so like I said, I'll be sharing this presentation um, as I share uh, in the study collaboration with Sherry Castle and many, many other um, collaborators, colleagues, students um, who aren't um, a part of this presentation, but are part of our larger Tulsa Seed study. So very briefly, um, I'm just gonna give you an outline of what Sherry and I will be talking about. We're gonna quickly define what is Tulsa Seed and then present to you Tulsa Seed's three big questions. So what are the big questions of this 2.0 next gen Tulsa research? Um, and we'll share some preliminary results that we've started to address those three big questions. Um, and then we have an opportunity to talk a little bit about what Tulsa Seed can tell all of us about the impacts of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic on children, families, and teachers. So one of the, um, perhaps one of the only bright sides of doing research in a global pandemic is the opportunity to pivot quickly and respond um, by generating actionable, useful information for policymakers, practitioners, and parents um, about what's going on, the impacts of this pandemic on the children that we are already studying. So we'll be able to share some of that with you all as well. So what is Tulsa SEED? Um, SEED stands for School Experiences and Early Development. And the Tulsa SEED study has been following low-income children and families in Tulsa uh, since 2016. The children were three years old at that time. So we sampled three-year-olds in 2016 who were attending some form of publicly funded center-based early childhood education. Um, at age three, this does not include TPS, Tulsa Public Schools, uh, school-based pre-kindergarten programs. Those begin at age four. So for our three-year-olds in 2016, we were looking at them in Tulsa Educare, which is an early childhood um, uh, intervention program, um, shares some of Head Start standards. We were looking at three-year-olds in CAP Tulsa Head Start, the same Head Start partnership um, that is coordinated well with Tulsa Public Schools, but stands alone. Same CAP Tulsa Head Start partners that Deborah, uh, Bill, and Sarah talked about. Um, and then some kids in community based childcare centers that they accessed with childcare subsidies if they were low income. Um, so that's the, the kind of early experiences of our three year olds that we started with uh, at age three in 2016. But our Tulsa Seed study is ambitious. Um, so we are planning to follow these children through 2023 when they'll be in fourth grade. So for those of you who prefer a picture to a bunch of words, this is our Tulsa Seed timeline. Um, starting in 2016 when children were three, going all the way to 2023 when children will be in fourth grade. 
um, kind of like a map, you are here. Here's where we are now, uh, 2020, 2021. Our kids are in second grade right now. Most of the research I'll talk about today um, just looks at that uh, four-year-old pre-K year to kindergarten outcomes. And I'll talk about why that is in a moment. Um, and then of course, when we talk about our COVID impacts, we're locating that last year when the COVID outbreak closed schools, uh, our children were in first grade. So just to orient you a little bit about the kind of broader study landscape. So Tulsa Seed is, um, like I said, ambitious. We learned well from uh, our mentors um, in the field, uh, Bill, um, Deborah, and, and Sarah. We know not to shy away from, from big, uh, important, consequential research questions. So um, we take a 365 degree view uh, in Tulsa Seed. We collect data on children's skills um, and behavior by assessing them directly. We also observe their classrooms. Um, we collect school administrative data and we administer surveys to uh, the parents and teachers of these children every single year of our um, Tulsa Seed study. So we were doing that uh, when the kids were um, three and four years old and, and continuing every year that they're in the Tulsa public schools. Um, so we aim to answer with this 360 degree data, three main questions, and I'll, I'll bullet those out in a minute, but the questions all kind of hover around um, identifying the classroom and teacher factors that create and sustain an early learning boost from pre-K through fourth grade. And so this is really a jumping off point from where Deborah Phillips left off at the end of her presentation and her kind of transition, which is, you know, we're moving beyond this um, really important question of does pre-K work? Our first generation predecessors um, took that one head on. Um, we are looking a little deeper into if it works, why? And focusing intently on classroom and teacher factors that might explain that. We focus particularly in Tulsa Seed on children's self-regulatory skill development. So self-regulatory skills include things like short-term or working memory, you know, keeping instructions in mind, um, being flexible, we call cognitive flexibility, being able to shift from one task to another to change the rules that you're following and follow a different set of rules, um, inhibitory control or controlling your impulses, and attention regulation, um, regulating your attention, regulating behavior. These are a constellation of skills called self-regulation that um, really underlie uh, in many ways academic success. Uh, so being able to sit still, keep directions in mind, resist your impulse, um, pay attention to the task at hand. These are things that we think fuel um, academic success and life success and certainly the research supports that idea. So we focus on children's self-regulatory development alongside cognitive development so we still do reading and math and literacy uh, and behavior assessments, but we focus a lot on self-regulation and SEED as well. Um, and as a result, on the drivers of self-regulation development. So when I say we think about teachers and classrooms um, in SEED, we think about the features of teachers and classrooms that might be especially likely to promote children's self-regulatory development. So the specific questions that we seek to answer in Tulsa SEED are, is there a pre-K boost into kindergarten? So this is in many ways kind of replicating what um, Bill and Deborah originally found in pre-K uh, 1.0. So we're asking that same question just to know how much has changed in this you know, 15 year gap between when they collected their data and we've, we've collected ours. Um, that first question is where we've done most of our work to date um, and a little bit on the subsequent questions that I'll talk about in a moment. So to remind you, uh, in Tulsa, in the year before kindergarten, four-year-old children could experience early care and education in one of four settings. So I told you that age three, they could be in an Educare center, in a CAP Tulsa Head Start center, um, or in a community-based center uh, funded through child care subsidies. Those were their center-based options at age three. But at age four, Tulsa public schools and public charter schools become available. So those serve four-year-olds um, in Tulsa. So school-based pre-K in a Tulsa public school, public or charter school is a main place that four-year-olds might receive their pre-K education in Tulsa. Then there's Head Start in a CAP Tulsa Head Start Center or Educare in an Educare Center. Again, those share a lot of their uh, program goals and programmatic requirements. 
Um, there's another center-based setting, like I mentioned, community-based childcare. And then of course, there's a group of children who we didn't look at at age three, but who might've experienced no formal center-based childcare at age four. So by the time we start to look at these kids in kindergarten, we're asking, is there a pre-K boost into kindergarten from attending one of these four things, including nothing at all? And I wanna emphasize here when asking a question about, is there a pre-K boost? It's incredibly important to consider for whom and compared to what, right? So comparing the red part of the pie to the orange part of the pie is a different question and we'll probably give a different answer than comparing the red part of the pie to the green part of the pie, for instance. So in our kind of emerging work uh, in uh, Tulsa Pre-K 2.0, Tulsa Seed, um, we have assessed children on those same outcomes that uh, Deborah and Bill presented earlier. So quantitative reasoning is this cluster of bars here on the left. That's a math, standardized math test and literacy, standardized um, early literacy skills test. And what we've been able to do is compare whether children in different types of pre-K settings show a boost on their kindergarten math and literacy skills. And the answer to that first question in our data is yes. So in comparison to children who experienced no center-based care, and those are those green bars, same as the green pie from the earlier slide, children who attended school-based pre-K in Tulsa public or charter schools, those are those red bars, had better kindergarten quantitative reasoning, math, and literacy scores than children who had no center-based care the prior year. Children who attended CAP Tulsa Head Start or Educare also had better kindergarten literacy scores, that's the orange bar there, compared to children who had no center-based care um, the prior year. So we are seeing evidence of a pre-K boost in pre-K 2.0, which is reassuring because like I said, our next question is why? And we're, we're glad we have a why to unpack. So this is really where Tulsa Seed gets going. We ask if there's a pre-K boost, what teacher and classroom features explain it? And like I said, we focus on things that we think might be particularly important when driving children's self-regulatory skills. So when we talk about teacher features and classroom features that might explain that pre-K boost, why that red bar was higher than the green bar, what explains that? We hone in on the exact features that we think are going to impinge on teachers' abilities to provide a well-regulated classroom environment. And just like decades of research on parent and child interactions, we know that teachers who experience stress and teachers who experience supports are gonna have different classroom processes. They're going to do different things with and for the children in their classroom that supports their children's self-regulatory skills differentially. So we focus on the stressors and supports that research has identified, particularly research on parents, to be things that affect teacher-child interactions and therefore would affect children's um, self-regulatory skills. So stressors and supports that might relate to teachers' abilities to provide a well-regulated classroom, an organized classroom, a calm classroom, a classroom with clear expectations for behavior, for clear rules around interactions between peers, um, norms and, and rules and regulations um, and predictable, sensitive and responsive interactions between teachers and children. So what do we find in our Tulsa Seed study regarding the kinds of stressors that again, research has highlighted at least um, in parents as uh, being disruptive to adult child interactions? we find that um, there are a lot of stress. Uh, there's a lot of stress experienced in the, the, the pre-K teachers in our sample. Um, and this includes pre-K teachers in public schools as well as those in those other settings, the Educare and the CAP Tulsa Head Start settings. So across all settings, 27% of teachers had salaries that were below a living wage in Tulsa. And a large percentage experienced um, elevated depressive symptoms, um, many of them reported being in less than very good health. So an easier way to say that would be poor health, about 60%. Um, and about 25, 27% um, reported experiencing food insecurity. So that's fully employed teachers reporting that they struggled to have food of sufficient quantity and quality to support a healthy lifestyle. So these are relatively high degrees of stress uh, reported by our pre-K teachers. 
On the flip side, on the positive side, in terms of supports these teachers experienced from their workplaces, um, they reported relatively high degrees of support. So, um, for instance, high degrees of teamwork approaching, you know, 85%. Um, lots of support around uh, applying learning, so kind of instructional experimentation with different approaches to teaching. Lots of support um, for their wellness, something like 43% reported um, a high degree of supports for wellness. Um, and then a lot of support around using child assessments, um, implementing assessment tools for their children uh, to understand where their children were in terms of development and learning. So high rates of stress, relatively high rates of support. Of course, the interesting question beyond that is how do those things link to observed classroom quality? And I told you earlier that every year we measure observationally children's classroom quality experiences. So across these pre-K classrooms, we asked how do these stressors and supports relate to observed quality? Um, and what we found that of the stressors, only salary, so higher salaries, that is salaries that meet or exceed a living wage in Tulsa, predicted better classroom quality. So that makes a lot of sense. More income, more resources, more stability on the teacher's side. Um, teachers were a little bit um, more sensitive, warm, and responsive to the children in their care. They had more organized classrooms. Um, despite high rates of teacher stressors, we really didn't see, for instance, you know, the high rate of depression predicting disrupted classroom quality or the high rate of food insecurity predicting disrupted classroom quality. Um, and what that suggests to us is that you know, these teachers are going to heroic um, lengths, probably. They are in many ways gating their own experiences. Um, and for whatever reason, those stressors that they experience um, are not infiltrating their classroom processes. Um, we saw more supports than stressors being related to classroom quality. So teachers who reported higher um, wellness, more wellness supports in their uh, work environments, more teamwork, and supports for applying learning and understanding how to use those child assessments um, had better classroom quality. So some suggestive evidence that administrative support, support from your colleagues, support from your administrators um, is very positive for observed classroom quality. And then of course, the final link would be between these stressors and supports and children's outcomes. And what we found here was that lower teacher household chaos, so chaos in the teacher's own homes, and lower rates of food insecurity, as well as higher teacher salaries, all predicted better child outcomes. So kind of, again, as you would suspect based on literature on adult child interactions, um, when teachers feel economically secure, when they're not struggling uh, to have sufficient amounts of food, um, and when they have less chaotic households, they are providing more regulated classrooms. Uh, possibly that would explain why they have children who have higher math, um, behavior, and self-regulatory skills. I do want to acknowledge that we found uh, one kind of unexpected association where um, higher teacher depressive symptoms and food insecurity were actually associated with better cognitive scores. Um, and our uh, speculative hypothesis about why that might be, again, relating to something I mentioned earlier, is perhaps there's a burden of competence here where um, you know, teachers, despite experiencing high degrees of stress, uh, are not, um, we're not seeing that stress come out in the ways they interact with children in their classrooms. Maybe teachers who take on uh, a lot of extra work in the classroom um, and really drive uh, children's learning are um, you know, on the back end you know, suffering in ways that we don't see in classroom quality. So um, a lot of food for thought, um, and we continue to think about this. I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Sherry Castle, to continue thinking about this, what explains the pre-K boost in terms of um, classroom and teacher processes and behavior. Yeah, thanks, Anna. So um, as Anna mentioned, we're really trying to dig into this question of what does, what are the mechanisms driving this pre-K boost? Um, and these are important questions so that we can um, try to replicate, you know, these good practices across um, uh, other programs and share that out across the, the state and, of course, the country. Um, and as Deborah mentioned earlier, um, Deborah Phillips, 
Um, researchers are really focused on identifying what we've come to call the active ingredients of classroom practices that are most influential on children's development. So we want to identify those features so that we can work to increase the beneficial practices and reduce the occurrence of practices that may have more negative impacts on development. Um, make sure that we're not having any unintended consequences as we calibrate our efforts to best support children's development. So um, as we look at kind of like teachers as people, um, who they are, the characteristics that they bring to the classroom, as well as the stressors and supports that they're experiencing and how that plays out and what happens in the classroom. Um, we also are really looking specifically at what are the teacher directed classroom processes and behaviors, those active ingredients that might explain the boost into pre-K or the pre-K boost into kindergarten. So really focusing on what teachers do um, in these classroom processes and teacher behaviors. So um, this is something that's been evolving over time um, in the field. Uh, originally, we were looking at what came to be known as more structural characteristics, such as the question that came up earlier about teacher-child ratio. Um, and what really, as Deborah mentioned earlier, um, it just came to be found that small changes in things like classroom teacher or teacher child ratio were not um, all that predictive of children's growth. Uh, so we've turned our attention to focus on these more um, process oriented things happening in the classrooms. And that's what um, Tulsa Seed is really focusing on um, and trying to push ourselves to utilize some newer measures um, and get at really the most accurate um, depiction of what is happening in those classrooms so that we can um, conclude uh, you know, with most accurate findings. So uh, as we consider what teachers do, we're focusing on um, things like proactive behavior management. So this means um, rather than sort of being in a perpetual firefighter mode of where you're just dealing with um, whatever chaos is happening, which we know all happens from time to time whenever you're dealing with young children, but generally you want to have routines and um, processes set up in your classroom so that the children know what to expect and they know um, what your expectations are. And that just helps everyone set everyone up for a successful engagement in the classroom, as well as help children begin to self monitor their own behavior as, as they try to match up to these classroom expectations that are readily described and discussed in the um, as the teacher goes about her day. Um, we also are looking at things like scaffolding of children's self-regulation. So this looks like teacher behaviors such as um, narrating children's experiences and um, putting labels to their emotions and helping them find good ways to calm or express their emotions um, whenever they may become angry or frustrated. Um, and so again, really strategically um, inserting themselves in the child's uh, activities as they go about the day to help provide um, the gradual scaffolding and supports for the child to control their own emotions, control their attention, control their engagement with the classroom materials um, as they move ahead. And then another aspect of what we consider with what teachers do is thinking about supporting of the peer interactions. So um, in these classrooms with young children, for many pre-K is their first exposure to um, extended amounts of time with peers. Um, and so there are going to be conflicts, there are going to be challenges and problems that need to be sorted out. And so again, here we're looking for um, the extent to which teachers are able to successfully help um, provide the child with scaffolding and instruction on how to navigate um, those interactions and um, develop their skills across the, the academic year and as they move on ahead to the older grades. We also think about um, emotional support more broadly um, and really look at things like positive climate and teacher sensitivity and regard for child perspective, which means that they give the child an appropriate level of autonomy. Okay, so whenever we really are talking about the Tulsa Seed study, as Anna mentioned, um, we've chosen to focus a great deal on children's self-regulatory outcomes um, because that is uh, an important um, marker of children's development and seems to be an important driver of children's sustained growth over time. Um, and we wanted to focus on what classroom processes and teacher behaviors are um, driving the 
uh, development of children's self-regulation as well. So um, as we did this, uh, we focused in on a handful of discrete classroom processes that are going on um, and uh, have some information to share with you about our findings. And this is again from the pre-K year um, in which children were either in public school pre-K or in Cap Tulsa pre-K, but here in this, as in the results that Anna described, um, we have all the classrooms put together and we're just describing the sample and experiences overall. So um, we were looking at a set of behaviors, um, including emotional support in which children um, were exposed to interactions with teachers that were both warm, emotionally warm and responsive, which means that the teacher pays attention to what the child is interested in and responds contingently to um, the child's bids for attention. Um, and we found that teachers provided moderately high levels of emotional support um, in these classrooms. And so overall, we were seeing really positive um, climates and uh, just pleasant, supportive environments to be in. On the flip side, our um, examination of the peer scaffolding or the scaffolding for children's peer interactions that was observed in the pre-K classrooms, we found relatively low levels of teachers' um, use of strategies to support the peer interactions. Um, and this is, you know, a less uh, explored area, and it's, you know, something that we'll talk about a little bit further, but um, this is an area of potential growth um, for pre-K teachers uh, as um, programs or school districts um, may see that as an important place to invest some efforts. Um, and then whenever we think about uh, teachers' efforts to guide the behaviors of children, we use two approaches to measure that. First, we counted um, teacher behaviors that were termed behavior disapprovals. So this includes any teacher behavior, whether it be verbal comments, gestures, or physical contact. So it could be a hand on the shoulder. Um, it could be physically moving a child away from a problematic behavior. And the, the main feature of this is that the focus of the teacher's effort is to stop a child's behavior. So they want to stop the child from talking out of turn. They want to stop the child from wandering around during group time or away from their um, station where they're you know, doing their work during that time. Um, and these behavior disapprovals only include reactive teacher behavior. So things they're doing in response to children's um, ongoing behaviors in the classroom and not the proactive guidance um, setting behavior expectations. So if a teacher sets a group of children down at a circle time and says, now remember during circle time, we you know, have a bubble in our mouth, we have our hands in our laps so that we can pay attention, that is not considered a behavior disapproval. Behavior disapprovals or are all of the shh and stop, not now Johnny kind of comments um, where teachers are being reactive to children's um, ongoing behaviors. Um, it's important to say that this does not necessarily mean that it's a negative intervention on children's behaviors, um, nor is it our expectation or I think anyone's hope or thought that these should be um, zero or anywhere near zero, um, but it is uh, an important marker of how well the classroom is kind of running itself, how well the children seem to know and are able to go along with the classroom routines and rules um, without needing that kind of ongoing um, Struck, like reminder to modify their behavior and also how the teacher is setting up those expectations as they go throughout the day. So in our observations, um, in a single morning of pre-K, we found an average of 109 behavior disapprovals from teachers um, across that morning observation. What's really interesting is that we found a, a very substantial range of counts of um, behavior disapprovals ranging from one classroom had 11 in the full, you know, three plus hours that we were there, um, up to 244 behavior disapprovals. Um, and so that's quite a range and, uh, you know, is something that has drawn our attention and interest. And, um, you know, kind of anecdotally, one thing that we certainly noticed, as you may, uh, if you've spent time in a classroom, you might not be surprised to find that often we would find that a single child or you know one or two children were the recipient of the vast majority of these behavior disapprovals. Um, our study is not 
able to assess that um, at this time, but I think that it was an important takeaway for us to really consider how these are spread around the classroom. Um, and finally, we coded something called red flags, which captures punitive behavior methods that might have happened at any point across the morning. Um, so the red flags were coded when teachers exhibit behaviors such as sarcasm, um, putting a child in isolation for more than four minutes, yelling, ignoring a child's physical or emotional need. Um, those things are, of course, things that we hope not to see in classrooms, but we know that sometimes, sometimes they happen. Um, we found that nearly 50% of teachers had no red flags. Um, so many children did not experience these things, but it was um, important for us to note when these behaviors were observed. So that kind of summarizes descriptively how the classrooms were doing on these various metrics. And then we wanted to next examine this question that we've posed to what extent these classroom processes relate to children's development of self-regulation across the pre-K year. So whenever we look at the various aspects of children's self-regulation and development, um, including things like attention um, control and impulse control, uh, as, as well as emotional regulation, um, we did find some benefit of emotional support in the classrooms. So as a reminder, that's when the teacher is warm and responsive in their interactions with the classroom as a whole, um, and they provide a um, uh, just a culture and climate within the classroom that is um, responsive to children's needs and provides children appropriate levels of autonomy. So we saw some benefits of that. Um, where we found more consistent associations were with these more negative behavior management strategies, both red flags, such as sarcasm and yelling, as well as counts of behavior disapprovals were linked to reduced growth and self-regulation. We also did some further analyses that uncovered an important pattern based on children's levels of self-regulation at pre-K entry. So that means how they showed up to pre-K in the fall. These findings indicate the children who entered pre-K with weaker self-regulation skills. So children who come in struggling a little bit with their self-regulation are more impacted by the negative strategies. So the red flags and the behavior disapprovals and less impacted, that is receive less benefit from the positive emotional climate in the classroom. So this sort of led us to thinking of this work as first do no harm, which highlights that as we continue to strive for classrooms that boost children's academic development, we must not lose sight of the importance of supportive classroom climates and providing the needed supports and professional um, development so that teachers can avoid negative interactions and behavior management strategies um, to make sure that we're not unintentionally having spillover effects that might be harming children um, or limiting their ability to develop these important self-regulation skills. And then moving on um, to our third question. So if there is a boost, does it sustain through fourth grade? And if so, why? And um, Bill did a great job earlier describing um, kind of this pattern of fade out or some people might term it more of kind of a catching up. Um, and uh, where children who did not have pre-K have kind of over time caught up to the children who did have free K um, and those effects become no longer detectable sometimes at third or fourth grade. Um, and that is of course an important question on our horizon, but as you might recall from Anna's um, nifty little timeline earlier, uh, the children are currently only in second grade. So we're not there yet, stay tuned. But, um, so our study was coasting along last year as many of us were just kind of going about our regular business and then um, we interrupt our regularly scheduled research study to have a worldwide pandemic. Um, so this was a certainly unanticipated um, feature of this study. We did not set out to be pandemic researchers, um, but here we are, as all of us are. Um, and we you know, adjusted accordingly, and it did, um, as Anna mentioned, provide us with an opportunity to really be able to speak about COVID impacts on kids families and teachers. So we're going to, um, as we have all done many times over the last nine months, pivot um, here in this presentation to describe um, how our study has pivoted and how we, uh, the findings that we have to share with you about COVID impacts to date. So um, as 
uh, I think this is a pretty consistent picture across the country, um, but here in Oklahoma, spring break began on March 13th. Um, by the end of that week, the Oklahoma State Board of Education had ordered a full stoppage of instructional activities. Um, and then schools across the state were allowed to resume April 6th, April 6th um, with fully remote instruction. So what did that mean for our study? So at this point um, in our study, we uh, were wrapping up our classroom observations and we were about to switch to our spring child assessments, but kids were gone, they were at home, schools were locked. Um, so we canceled our spring child assessments. Um, and I think at this point, many of us were just kind of along for the ride, not sure how long this would last, you know, going just to see how things were developing. Um, but it became increasingly clear that this pandemic would be a formative event um, and that we would, we would want to be able to document our participants' experiences. Um, so it was important to us to be able to document the, the kids' experiences, um, not only because it's an important feature of their development, um, and as we're looking to see the lasting impacts of pre-K, we're of course going to need to be able to account for any changes that happened um, during the COVID pandemic. Um, but then it was also important more broadly, uh, we were positioned as researchers who were in the middle of a longitudinal study um, where we already had an existing sample about whom we knew quite a bit. We've been following many of these children since they were three years old. And so we know a lot about them, about their development, about their families. Um, and so we were positioned to really see um, what the experiences of children were during the pandemic and how it might vary for people with different characteristics um, prior to the pandemic. So um, we went ahead and did a, a survey of both teachers. This is the first grade teachers and parents at the conclusion of last academic year. Um, and those were collected May through July of 2020. Um, and our surveys did include about 43% of the families in the study. So that's about 85%, 85% of those who responded um, are currently in Tulsa Public Schools. And 80% of the first grade um, teachers responded to our survey. And um, both of those were pretty representative and similar to the samples overall. So our questions about child development in a pandemic. Um, how have families fared during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic? So again, this is just that initial window and onset. Um, how have the teachers fared? How did distance learning go? This first foray into teachers learning to do um, circle time of six and seven year olds uh, over Zoom. You know, it was a really um, kind of a uh, bizarre time for us all. And how have schools supported families and teachers? So this was a time where many people were rapidly deployed to try to provide as much support as possible. Next slide, Anna. So um, the results of our surveys uh, indicate that families faced loss of work, loss of income, and food insecurity since the pandemic began. Um, and we, these are metrics, um, family income, food, food security, that we monitor regularly because these are things that have been found to be really impactful in children's development in quote unquote normal times. Um, so during this pandemic, we really wanted to see how families were doing um, with these important uh, measures um, to, so that we would have one indication of how the family was functioning during this time. So you can see here that um, a substantial number of families were seeing decreased in work hours, decrease in household income, um, and uh, substantial numbers of families experiencing food insecurity. So, and importantly, the struggles were not uniform and the Latinx and Native American families reported greater struggle in these areas more than the other members of our sample. Um, and also depressive symptoms were tied to food insecurity. So parents who are food insecure were twice as likely to report feeling depressed as parents who were food secure. So there we're seeing some spillover effects potentially of um, these kind of structural and economic burdens that families are experiencing. Parents and children's mental and behavioral health also had some consequences during the initial onset of the COVID pandemic. 
Um, among parents, one out of four reported experiencing depressive symptoms since the start of the pandemic. And of the parents, nearly 50% said that their child has experienced increased emotional or behavioral problems since the pandemic began. So again, these are measures that are just really um, not intensive measures, but just kind of quick checks to see how are the, how are the parents, how are the children doing, um, because we know that these are important markers of well-being in typical times, and we anticipate that they're also important markers during this pandemic. We also asked similar questions about the teachers of the first grade children in our sample, and they also reported um, challenges during this time. So we asked them about food insecurity and about their household income. Um, and although uh, teachers retained their jobs, um, you know, even the support staff, at least here in Oklahoma, were paid throughout their the end of their contract year. Um, so the the teacher's own income should not have decreased, but if they had a partner or an adult child in their home who was contributing to the household income, one out of four reported a decrease in household income, which is a, a stressor for the household and the teacher, and this report of food insecurity among the teachers as well. Um, we also found that one in three teachers experienced depressive symptoms, and so that's um, an important thing to note because that exceeds that level of our low income parents who were reporting um, depressive symptoms during this time. So that's important for us to attend to. Um, and as with parents, the food insecurity and the depression were related. Um, teachers were more likely to um, report feeling depressed if they were experiencing food insecurity compared to those who um, had more secure access to food. So this was a time, challenging time for teachers. Um, as you know, as we all are aware. Um, so encouragingly though, the, uh, the districts and the um, other nonprofit agencies around this, the city and the state were able to really mobilize and provide quite a bit of support to um, teachers and families during this time. So schools and school districts really are lifelines for families during a crisis. You know, I think our findings here indicate that um, really all schools are community schools. They may not have that um, formal build out of services as something termed community schools, but all do um, provide these umbrella services that are not necessarily always recognized. Um, Tulsa Public Schools provided food and technology support to families and it really matters. Um, we had parents report the supports that they received from their child's school. And you can, since you can see that over half took advantage of the free meals, food and or groceries um, provided by their schools. So these were important resources and the districts really went to um, just heroic efforts um, to make sure that these meals were available including um, sending them out on buses so that families who might not be able to make it to the school for pickup, numerous pickup stations across the city. Um, so these were all really important supports that we were able to um, see happen in the community and we think they were valuable for the families as well. So as we consider our next steps um, moving forward, so we have some step, next steps that are COVID related um, and this includes um, uh, trialing out some remote child assessments. We haven't seen the children in our study um, to be able to assess their ongoing development in over a year now. Um, we missed our spring assessments. We've also now missed our fall assessments. Um, so we've been um, trialing this idea of being able to assess them over Zoom. We've had some success with that. We're gonna continue to see if we can make that happen in a way that is meaningful um, and allows us to reach accurate conclusions. Um, we're also trying, as um, Tulsa Public Schools has been primarily in distance learning um, throughout the fall semester. So um, we're trying to see what we can access from the, the Canvas, which is their learning management system that they use, and from the Canvas data, understand the learning and the participation during COVID. So things like how often does ch do children log on? Um, were they completing the assignments that teachers set out for them to do? And what is even the variation in the types and amounts of assignments that teachers are assigning to the children in their classroom? Um, and then we will be repeating surveys of the life experiences during the pandemic for both the parents as well as for um, our teachers who are now 
these are second grade teachers. So seeing how everyone is faring um, as the pandemic continues um, much longer than I think most of us initially thought it might. Um, more broadly, the seed study must go on. We try to, um, we've had to make some adjustments, many adjustments, um, but our overarching goals remain the same. So we still really want to follow children to the fourth grade to um, look at how their continued growth is supported um, and consider uh, features that may be impacting the anticipated convergence of the pre-K and the non-pre-K group. So we're going to be observing in the classrooms every year and documenting those experiences and ongoing development of the children. And then um, a unique aspect of this study is that we're uh, securing permission from the parents to access their children's health records um, so that we can examine impacts of pre-K beyond educational well-being to see um, does pre-K participation um, lend the children to have up-to-date immunizations, for example, to have a medical home that they visit rather than utilizing something like the emergency room um, for care whenever it may be unnecessary. So we um, are preparing to move forward with that work as well. Um, and we hope that you all will uh, join us again sometime in the years to come to hear updates on um, all of our ongoing work. So I will wrap up and just um, join all, all of the colleagues who've taken the floor today um, from the first team and our team as well to just say thank you um, to our funders, which you can see listed here. We're um, fortunate to have a real um, great set of partners investing in our work, ranging from a group of foundations to um, the universities, as well as uh, the National Institutes of Health. Um, and then we really appreciate all of our team members that you can see listed here. And of course, all of our data collectors who we couldn't possibly all list on the slide, but um, you know, are so valuable and provide important um, high quality data for us to be able to tell the story of the teachers and families and children in our study um, and be able to answer these important questions. So at this point, I think we have just a few minutes to be able to take some questions. So Anna, do you have some ready for us? Um, yes, I've been having a lively um, exchange while trying to advance your slides on time, which really does test my, um, I don't know if it's cognitive flexibility or attentional control, but um, uh, a couple of really great questions. Going back to um, my part of the presentation, I presented some statistics on teachers, and one of the things I pointed out was that a large percentage of teachers, close to 60%, reported being in less than very good health. Um, and we had a question about whether um, we can corroborate that um, with any uh, you know, administrative reports of um, teacher sick leave or something like that. And my response is, unfortunately, um, not with the data that we have access to right now. We have rich administrative data from the school districts on our children. Um, and while our teachers have consented to be part of our study and have been excellent partners all along, we don't have, to my knowledge, um, the ability to access their administrative data, payroll, benefits, leave, things like that. So that would be a great, um, a great question to ask. Right, yes, and I will make a pitch for, I believe, the January session where um, I think there will be some more in-depth discussion of um, teacher well-being, including physical well-being, because yeah, that's something that we, um, we have many, many questions we would like to ask these teachers, but we have to kind of control ourselves and not drown them in a 5,000 item survey. So we don't have too many details. And then a question, Sherry, that you're perfectly positioned to answer, I think, is um, when you were talking about the behavioral disapprovals and more specifically the red flags for in the second half of the presentation, um, somebody raised an excellent question about um, do we have any sense, I know the sweeps and counts are about the teacher's use of the punitive strategies and responses. Do we have any data on the triggers or you know, the numbers of kind of student level outbursts um, that we could control for? Um, the point being made was, you know, if there have been six outbursts and the teacher kind of responds negatively on the seventh, that's very different than zero outbursts and the teacher responding negatively on the first. Yes, yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, so during this time, um, uh, you know, I think the, the quote unquote ivory tower has a, you know, a rap for being slow to change and being, you know, kind of averse to this kind of dialogue, but we're really trying to push our measures forward. So we have shifted measurement tools um, between the pre-K and kindergarten year to be able to um, 
allow us to address that type of question at least a little bit better, where we will be, um, we're capturing children's individual behaviors, and we are um, trying to code things like, you know, I mean, in some classrooms, you have just children with really who really struggle with their self-regulation and may try to exit the classroom if they become overwhelmed or, you know, these things that become safety issues. And so you really do have to intervene. Um, so from um, the data that we reported today, that data said, I don't think that we're able to really get to this more um, back and forth uh, dynamic interactions, but that's um, an important question and something that we uh, should always keep in mind. Agree. Um, well, we're right at that 15 minute mark. So um, I'll say uh, just thank you again on behalf of myself. Um, Sherry, thank our funders, our data collectors, our partners, TPS, the parents and children who participated, the teachers who participated, um, and all of you for um, attending and asking such excellent questions. Thank you so much. Um, great presentation. So so rich, I think we could have dove into some of your data for about a couple of hours. So um, really appreciate um, the, again, how you're advancing our knowledge. Um, I know that many of us are frequently um, faced with uh, questions about benefits of early childhood, pre-K participation. Um, you all are not only informing the field in Oklahoma, but nationally about what we're seeing with our kids. And so we so appreciate your research and presenting to us today. Um, so next, we're going to transition into um, hearing back from our State Department of Education in regards to um, kind of reflecting on the information research literature that we know about what um, has been successful, the areas that we see that we might um, be able to think about for quality improvements into the future. And joining us to lead that discussion is Tiffany Neal, who's a deputy superintendent with the State Department of Education. And so Tiffany, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Deborah. I'm going to, um, to work to share my screen um, and navigate the presentation. So I just wanna make sure here um, that, let's see, we should be good to go. Uh, if I could get a verbal, maybe, Deborah, are you able to see the screen just to make yeah. sure? See you One... very, very well. Great. Thank you, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, so happy to share with you a few of the State Department of Education, early childhood education projects that we're focusing on currently and we plan to focus on in the near and long term um, time period. We do have several projects to share. I'm choosing uh, to highlight a few that I think might be most pertinent for uh, our, our participants today. So as a reminder, Superintendent Hoffmeister mentioned this, but early childhood education is a priority for the State Department of Education and Superintendent as evidenced by our Oklahoma ESSA plan or Oklahoma EDGE plan. Uh, as she mentioned, one of the few strategies that is highlighted in this particular plan is a focus on early childhood education with one of the six goals being to align early childhood education and learning foundations to ensure at least 75% of students are ready to read upon kindergarten entry. In, uh, at the conclusion of our presentation today, I'll share the slide deck with all of the links to the documents and resources I'll be sharing today. So you'll have access to that. So I wanna start by focusing on a, a very important partnership that superintendent highlighted at the opening of our webinar today. And that is our early childhood education research partnership with uh, our regional education laboratory Southwest. The projects that we focus on in this partnership are really designed to examine and address issues of equity or inequities in state funded early childhood education and support early childhood educators with evidence based instruction and assessment practices. So I want to share with you a few of those projects uh, that we are partnered on. One that uh, we have been working on for the last couple of years with our REL partners is a state uh, funded pre-K participation study. So this is a descriptive study designed uh, to help us better understand who is participating in state funded pre-K or not, and if there are variations in participation among student subgroups and regions of the state. 
we're very pleased to announce that the hard work of this study uh, will, will appear in publication next week, December 16th. Uh, the, the study will be published as well as some informational documents uh, that will assist uh, both us and others in better understanding the aspects of the study that we feel are important to highlight. I'm going to share a few of the broad results from the study with you today. So keeping in mind that the descriptive study really took a look at students who participated in state funded pre-K from 2014-15 school year to 2018-19. And here are a few of, of the findings of the study. So first, uh, we are learning that a greater percentage of students participated in state funded pre-K uh, from rural districts than non-rural districts. We're also finding that there was a difference in participation by various student subgroups. And so when we're talking about subgroups, we looked at a variety of things, race and ethnicity. We looked at students who were receiving special education services uh, compared to those not receiving services and tried to better understand uh, if there was a difference in participation in, in state funded pre-K. Uh, we also looked at, uh, certainly looked at um, differences in subgroup population by demographics. Uh, and there will be some interesting findings, uh, additional findings in the report that you can take a look at starting next week, December 16th. Um, additionally, in the study, we were able to surmise that students who lived farther from a state funded pre K site were less likely to participate. However, students who lived hard, farther from a Head Start Center were more likely to participate in the state funded pre K programs. Another project I want to share with you that we are undertaking as part of the partnership is to launch a survey uh, really aimed at understanding pre-K curricula and instruction. So the purpose of this survey will be to capture a better understanding of the curricula and instructional practices utilized in our pre-K classrooms. An additional component of the survey is, is really um, one in which we hope to better understand how teachers may have adjusted instructional practices to accommodate for the specific conditions of this year and the global pandemic. So how did instruction change for pre-K teachers when they moved to virtual uh, instruction? Or how might things have changed if they stayed in traditional or in-person instruction uh, but they had to modify to adjust for safety concerns. And then also looking at any of uh, our teacher practices if they embarked on hybrid teaching. We had actually launched this particular survey in the spring about a week before schools uh, were closed due to the global pandemic. So we are relaunching the survey uh, early winter or uh, I'm sorry, late winter or early spring of 21. And this will allow us to add a few questions that really help us understand impacts uh, due to the pandemic this year. Another uh, pretty significant project that we're undertaking with our partnership is the implementation of our early learning inventory pilot study. So in this particular project, we are going to be piloting an early learning inventory um, survey that we hope will support school districts in gathering information about what students know and can do at the time of kindergarten entry. We also ho hope that the inventory um, can be used by teachers to assist them in data-driven instructional decision making. And of course, also that the tool would assist schools in identifying individual student needs and providing the necessary supports for those needs. The early learning inventory that we will be piloting uh, will be an adapted form of the early learning inventory utilized by our wonderful partners at the New Mexico State Department of Education. The inventory itself um, will be based on a, a system of rubrics that teachers will utilize to make observations of students in their classrooms to better understand sort of the well-rounded view or the whole child um, uh, ability to be ready for that kindergarten year. The survey itself, I'm sorry, the inventory itself will address the following of domains, physical development, health and well-being, literacy, mathematics, scientific conceptual understanding, self, family and community, and approaches to learning. So again, this inventory would allow teachers through rubrics for each of these domains to better understand where students are at in their readiness uh, for kindergarten. The pilot study itself um, will occur in the school year 21-22, uh, 
And we are looking uh, to recruit 16 districts, approximately 32 schools and 80 kindergarten teachers to participate in the pilot study. Uh, those participating in the pilot study will receive professional development this summer on the tool, on the implementation of the tool, and on the data entry that we are looking at um, teachers participating in the in the study to utilize to capture their findings. We do believe there will be a little bit of attrition, so uh, we really hope by the end of the study that we maintain 15 districts, approximately 30 schools, and 60 kindergarten teachers. One of the things we're really hopeful of in the study is to understand the usefulness of the inventory, um, but also uh, to understand uh, how teachers uh, can utilize easily a dashboard that we are creating where they can enter in the data and then the districts would have access to the dashboard to better understand uh, some of this information or data across their district districts as it pertains to kindergarten readiness. Uh, I should mention before I move on, there, there certainly is another focus area for our partnership with, with RHEL and that is uh, in general, we are looking to support our, our pre-K teachers and kindergarten teachers with better instructional formative assessments. And uh, one of the initiatives we're undertaking is uh, to develop and study a series of professional development opportunities for teachers that would help them really um, better uh, implement equitable formative assessments in the classroom and examine their own teacher biases as it relates to student assessment so that they might then um, better um, assess students and provide the instructional supports needed in the classroom. Another initiative that I want to tell you about is uh, really an initiative that we have been embarking on, on in the State Department of Education for the last couple of years. Um, this initiative is known as the Champions of Excellence Initiative, and some of you in our state may be aware of this initiative. Uh, the initiative is in its early stages, but the idea is that with uh, the Champions of Excellence Initiative, we hope to be poised to rethink the way Oklahomans appreciate and support the work happening in schools. With this particular initiative, we want to identify excellence happening within our schools, celebrate that excellence, and share the wisdom across our districts in the state. So how the initiative works is that we have worked for the last couple of years with stakeholders within our state, school districts, educators, uh, researchers, and our university professionals in pre-service education to really develop for different subject areas um, a vision for quality instruction and what it takes to achieve that quality instruction for all students. And the way we've worked to envision that excellence is by developing uh, a series of rubrics that helps guide school districts and teachers uh, in different areas of excellence as it relates to teaching and learning. Uh, our ultimate goal is once we've identified all of those areas that support excellence in teaching and learning and all of the subcomponents for those areas that support that, uh, our goal is then to really align much of our support at the State Department of Education in the way of guidance and professional development to be responsive and aligned to those um, criteria that would be envisioned in the rubric. And then lastly, our goal is to celebrate schools who would be achieving excellence by um, implementing those strategies or those criteria in the rubric. Now, the way that we would celebrate uh, excellence is one we feel is unique from other states and what we've seen, but for each subject area, a school would be able to identify themselves as or self-identify as bronze, silver, or gold status as it relates to a program of excellence in that subject area. So I want to show you an example uh, of our draft mathematics program of excellence rubric, just to give you an idea of what, what we may be envisioning here. So here's an example of category three in the mathematics program of excellence rubric. Category three focuses on instruction, and it would share with school districts in order to achieve a bronze status for programs of excellence in mathematics your school would need to be able to say that you are achieving these criteria in the rubric. 
some of the criteria in the rubric here that we see before us includes that the school would be utilizing effective teaching practices as identified through evidence-based uh, measures for mathematics instruction. So some of these effective teaching practices listed in the rubric include implementation of tasks that promote reasoning and problem solving, uh, building procedural fluency from conceptual understanding. Another area of this mathematics rubric under the category of instruction focuses on, um, on showcasing that schools are utilizing mathematical tasks that develop reasoning, critical thinking, and problem solving. The idea behind the rubrics uh, and, and certainly the self-identification by schools that they may be a bronze, silver, or gold school for a particular program of excellence is that a committee within the school would come together to really review the rubric and to analyze um, the the instruction that is going on in their school and the curricula they have the curricula they have available. Some other areas in the rubrics include assessment and professional learning. Um, and they have their own sub criteria. So the school would bring a committee together, they would determine where they're at in the progress of a program of excellence, and then present all of their findings to their local school board and the school board would sign off on the school identifying as a program of excellence for bronze, silver or gold, and then submit that to us at the State Department of Education. Now, one way we hope to further celebrate schools who are embarking on this program of excellence work is by highlighting their status as a program of excellence on our statewide school dashboards. So here you can see, this is an example of a school uh, dashboard, Mustang High School, uh, and what would be available for every school on the landing page of their dashboard to showcase for community members um, and other school districts uh, around the state is um, would be all of these areas of program of excellence. Now, when a school determines that they're going to focus or prioritize an area to really work to grow or achieve uh, further progress in that program of excellence, they notify us at the State Department of Education. Uh, this is an area we're actively pursuing and working on and studying to determine if we are a program of excellence. And what we do is we, we highlight that dashboard blue so that community members understand that this is an area that the school district is really focused on or the school is really focused on. And then starting uh, next school year, the districts, the schools would start submitting their programs of excellence self evaluations. And now on the dashboard, what you would see is either gold, silver or bronze if a school has achieved that distinction uh, for the program of excellence. So why might I be sharing this information uh, right now? Well, one of the things we are looking at in the next year is developing a specific program of excellence rubric for early childhood education. And we are looking at uh, sort of that pre-K through third grade framework for the rubric as we understand the importance of looking at a system of early childhood education. As we develop that rubric in the coming year, we will work with partners uh, such as on the call today, as well as researchers and uh, district leaders and educators in our state to develop that program of excellence. As you can imagine, much of the information and data shared from our researchers earlier today, we can use to inform the criteria that we place in the rubric uh, for the program of excellence in early childhood education. Again, we're, we would be working on the program of excellence rubric this year, which means it would be uh, two years before schools could start identifying themselves as a program of excellence, bronze, silver, or gold for early childhood education. So I'm moving a little fast today because there's a lot to share, but we'll take uh, questions uh, in just a moment as we have time. I wanna share with you a few of the guidance and resource documents um, that we've been working on in the last year at the State Department of Education through partnerships in our state. One of the guidance resources was mentioned earlier by Superintendent Hoffmeister. Uh, in August of this school year, we published a series of return to learn uh, instructional guidance documents for teachers and school districts to utilize as they prepared for the unique challenges they might be facing for the 2021 school year. So we developed uh, 
a multi-page document specifically providing guidance to educators around pre-K and kindergarten instruction and resources uh, around distance learning, both um, virtual and non-virtual distance learning. Another resource that we worked to develop this last year is the Early Childhood Transition Toolkit. The toolkit itself is a guide to support schools as they guide positive, effective bridges into early elementary grades and an ensure a continuum of learning across home, child care, preschool, and school. In this particular guidance document, we partnered with, um, with OPSR at, through grant funding to develop this document. The document itself is available to school districts. Uh, as you can ima imagine, with the pandemic, we we had planned prior to the pandemic to roll this document out with professional development this summer, but um, due to other uh, focal areas that we had to undertake, we are putting off that initiative or that focus for professional development uh, until this upcoming school year. Uh, However, in the presentation, again, I'm going to share the link to the presentation. You'll have access to this document as well as all of the other documents uh, that have been shared in the presentation today. So I wanna end by saying, um, although it has been a, a very challenging year for all of us and certainly for our school leaders and our teachers, um, myself as the Deputy Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction and Laura Jinks Jones, who is our Director of Elementary Education, have um, just been so overwhelmed uh, in such a good way uh, by the wonderful support uh, that we've received from our early childhood education partners and educators in the state to continue to move many of these initiatives forward so that when the time comes um, and, and we're looking at uh, all of the support structures that may be needed to address any um, disruptions in learning this year, we hope to uh, be able to provide those supports in a timely manner um, towards the end of this school year. So I'm gonna pause there and see if there might be any questions. Uh, perhaps Courtney can help me understand if there are uh, questions that have arisen in the Q&A chat box. We did have one question and it is the following. You shared that you want 70% of children ready to read upon kindergarten entry. What do you mean specifically by ready to read? That is a great question. So when, when we talk about ready to read, we're really looking at um, what are those skills identified for foundational literacy in our pre-K standards and moving into our kindergarten standards. And so uh, again, I'm happy to share a, a link to those standards in the chat box, but when we think about um, sort of um, letter recognition and those sort of things, uh, that's really what we're, we're talking about. Keeping in mind that the Oklahoma academic standards for pre-K uh, early reading and kindergarten early reading are really those learning goals we hope students achieve by the end of those grade levels. And then, um, you know, it, it's certainly then up to the school districts or teachers to determine the instruction they use to help students meet those goals. Thank you. Thank so you. <laughs> Thank you. And there are no other questions at this time. Thank you, Tiffany, for sharing all that information and resources. Hi, everyone. I'm Diane Horm. I'm um, associated with the Early Childhood Education Institute at OU Tulsa, who is one of the co-sponsors, along with OPSR, for today's webinar. And in closing, I just want to once again thank um, our excellent presenters. We had a series of just wonderful presentations today. So thanks to the first Tulsa pre-K study team, to Drs. Deborah Phillips, Bill Gormley, and Sarah Anderson for um, their work that has changed the landscape of pre-K across Oklahoma and indeed across the US. And thanks also to the second Tulsa pre-K study team. Again, Dr. Um, Anna Johnson and Sherry Castle and Deborah Phillips along with me, we're all involved in that study. Um, the SEED study, we look forward to the generation two findings to give more detail about those important classroom processes. And um, as Deborah Anderson noted in her introduction to today's webinar, this is a um, new this is a new series that's a collaborative effort between OPSR and the Early Childhood Education Institute at OU Tulsa. So in closing today, I want to urge you to give us feedback um, through an evaluation that we will be sending to you. 
We are especially interested in hearing your thoughts on future topics that are relevant to you. Um, you will be receiving an email in a day or two that will have several links. Um, one will be a link to the recording for today's session. So you will have access to the recording, which will have all the presentations along with the PowerPoint slides that were used. You will ha also have access to the questions posed and answered today, and also a link to an evaluation. And as I urge you, I will guarantee you that we will pay attention to the evaluation. We promise that we want your feedback and we'll use it to shape future programs. I also wanna to spend time in closing today to promote our next two sessions. We planned three sessions. Today was the first, there are two more coming. Webinar two, which is entitled Investments in Teachers, Key to Quality Early Childhood Education, Child Well-Being, and Strong Economic Future. And that is scheduled for Wednesday, January the 13th from 1 to 4 Central Time. Our speakers will include Oklahoma DHS Director Justin Brown, Dr. Lynn Carroly, who will be talking about estimating the cost for quality early childhood workforce in Oklahoma, Dr. Mary Louise Hameter from Vanderbilt University, who will be talking about the pyramid model, and Drs. Kyung Ah Kwan and Ken Randall from OU Tulsa, who will be presenting the results of their multidisciplinary Happy Teacher Project. And Sherry Castle gave reference to this presentation that will give more details about teachers' self reported health status. The third webinar in our series is entitled Oklahoma's Roadmap, Driving Early Childhood Practice and Policy and Research. And that is scheduled for Wednesday, February the 10th from one to four. And at this time, the speakers include Erica Greenberg from the Urban Institute, who will be speaking on the topic of examining equity in Oklahoma's early childhood landscape. And Maddie Kim, who is at UT Austin and her topic will be um, developing a policy roadmap for Oklahoma's early childhood education. So we're very excited about this series of three webinars. And if today is any indication, we can expect, we can expect two more fabulous webinars um, in the upcoming ones. I have just one other announcement for today. And that is on Tuesday, December the 15th at 9 a.m., Cabinet Secretary Justin Brown will be making an exciting announcement about the launch of a newly created clearinghouse for early childhood success. We encourage you to register for this webinar to learn more about plans to complement the existing initiatives that are already happening in our state to improve quality and um, introduce innovation through evidence-informed practices. You will receive a meeting invitation following um, today's webinar, with, which will have a link to register for the announcement of the Clearinghouse on Early Childhood Success. And when you do complete the registration to attend the December 15th, 9 a.m. meeting about the Clearinghouse for Early Childhood Success, you'll receive a link um, that, um, that you can then attend um, that uh, announcement that day. So um, with these announcements, I just wanna close today's first webinar by again, thanking our excellent speakers. And I also wanna give a shout out to our very dedicated and talented planning committee that consists of staff from both OPSR and the Early Childhood Education Institute at OU Tulsa. So I look forward to virtually seeing you again on session two, which will be January the 13th. And thank you for your time and your attendance and your thoughtful questions today. And um, thank you for the work you do on behalf of Oklahoma's children and families. Thank you.